Hello, everyone. Welcome to Astronomy on Tap. Uh, this is our Astronomy on Tap for the month of March. Um, Pi Day, it's March 14th, 3.14. And, and I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm your, your host for this evening's event. I'm a computational astrophysicist at Caltech. And we have a great event that's planned for tonight. Some wonderful talks and some interesting things to talk about during our pub trivia segment in the second half. Thanks for, thanks for taking your Monday night to, to join in. Uh, a couple of announcements, and then I will bring our speakers on, and each speaker will give a 15-minute presentation um, on their research, on the, on, on the exploration of Venus first, and then on uh, astronomical clocks and what they've revealed about the physical processes in, in the world around us over the last 400 years or so. Super exciting stuff. And then we'll, we'll, um, we'll take Q&A from, from all of you on whatever platform you're watching this on, whether it be uh, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and then we'll have, so we'll, you can ask your questions through those, those different chat media, and I'll, I'll pick out the questions and ask them of our speakers. And we'll do Q&A for each speaker for about five to 10 minutes or so. And so between the two presentations and the two Q and A's, uh, that should take about an hour or so. Uh, and then we'll jump directly into pub trivia, astronomy themed pub trivia, because everybody likes pub trivia. And it's interactive. So all of you who wants to at home can, can participate by, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put up a, a link or a, a website that you can go to. There's no registration, there's no fee, there's no nothing. You just go to it. And then when you submit your, uh, the questions will pop up um, in series as we go through the night. And as they do, you can submit your answer and it'll it'll show up on the screen that I'm sharing to, to everyone here. So we can see how everyone's doing and every, if everyone has it figured out or doesn't have it figured out. Um, yeah, it's pretty fun. I, I enjoy it. Uh, let's see. these. These events, Astronomy on Tap events happen about once a month. Um, as I said, this is our, our March event. I haven't yet figured out both of the speakers for next month. One though will be Dr. Ethan Siegel, who is um, is really prominent. He's an astrophysicist who now is a writer. He has a like a weekly column in Forbes magazine. You, you I think I think his column is ends with a ends with a bang starts with a bang something like that anyway it's it's a pretty interesting column and and um, so he'll be joining us next month and then we have a sister series of events called the Caltech astronomy stargazing lecture that occur once a month our next one of those will be April 8th Friday night April 8th and will be given by Professor Saul Tokolsky who's a senior professor in the Caltech astronomy department who primarily works with um, numerical relativity, uh, gravitational waves, the strong, strong uh, gravitational regime, the extreme gravitational regime around black holes and white dwarfs and, and things like that. And um, yeah, should be really interesting. He's going to talk about uh, about relativity and, and, and gravitational waves. He was involved with the LIGO team and such, so it should be really good. But uh, I think, oh, and and I am actively trying to get these back to doing to happening in person. Uh, but don't fret if you are a person who does not live in the Los Angeles area, or even if you do live in LA and you don't want to drive um, a long ways to go to a bar. I mean, it's fun. But um, I am going to seek to, at the very least, record these events and then put them on YouTube uh, and hopefully be able to live record them and live stream them. But that probably won't happen for the next month or two. I'm, I'm, I'm seeking out uh, venues where we can host these. But traditionally, Astronomy on Tap is hosted in a bar and everybody gets to have a drink if they want and hear about science and have pub trivia with prizes and stuff. So yeah, I think those are all my announcements. So let me welcome on our two speakers for tonight. Max and Amy, do you guys want to join me? Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> what, what's that? It's going. It's going. I really like your back to Venus shirt, like back to the future. That's pretty sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Is Thanks there a way me. that 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 uh, that plebes like myself can purchase such a such a, a shirt? Absolutely. I can send you the uh, I can send you the link. It's uh, one of my co eyes on Da Vinci. He designed them, and they're selling them for no no profit. It's just because we want to get Venus out there. Oh, sweet. 
-hmm. Is it something that we can offer to the, the people who are viewing? Totally. It's on Redbubble. So uh, if there's oh. a way for me to send you the link and you can share it with everybody. Sure, sure, sure. I can put it in the in the various different uh, chat comments and stuff so people can check it out. if they Awesome. Want. Yeah, it's a awesome. pretty good here. Who knew this was going to have merch? <laughs> um, oh, Max, you've got University of Chicago. OK, that's a that's a respectable uh, astronomical observatory. Oh, you're not, not inverted. Though, so you, you got you to gotta flip it in your head. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Well, as I said, Astronomy on Tap is typically held in a bar. Um, are you guys, not that there's pressure to do so, but are you guys uh, consuming, imbibing any kind of beverages? Ooh. Oh, nice glasses, team. Yeah, that's right. Clink. Ooh, it disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what are you guys drinking? I've got some Glen Morangy Scotch. Cool. Got some Weller bourbon. Oh, you wow. Win. That's the better are, drink. You guys are outclassing my uh, my Hellas beer. The lightest one. <laughs> the lightest one. It's. It, I didn't want to get too saucy tonight. So. <laughs> mm. Anyway. Um, okay. Well, Amy, I believe you are our first speaker. Would you like to share your screen and I can give a, a brief introduction? Absolutely. I thought you were going to say the first contestant. <laughs> either the price is right or squid game I'm not <laughs> yes i will share my screen squid game pretty rough pretty and rough tell me what you see yeah it's the it's the slide it looks great excellent um okay dr amy hoffman is a geochemist working at the nasa jet propulsion laboratory her research focuses on the physical and chemical processes responsible for modifying various solar system materials, and particularly in studying the isotopic composition of different planets and moons in our solar system. Uh, she is a member of the NASA Mars Curiosity and the NASA Venus Da Vinci teams, of which we're going to hear about tonight. And in addition, Dr. Hoffman is a voracious reader, and she enjoys the outdoors and CrossFit. Oh, cool. That's cool. <laughs> Nobody should ask me to flex though, because that would just be inappropriate. <laughs> Unless I have enough scotch, I guess. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us, Amy. I'll let you uh, go from here. Absolutely. All right. Well, hello, interwebs, everyone out in the ether. There, uh, I'm coming to you today, not necessarily as a JPLer, not as a Caltecher, but just as a science, a scientist, uh, a co-investigator on the Da Vinci mission. And I want to, you know, share a little bit of my enthusiasm for this mission. You know, uh, you may not have heard of it. It depends, you know, how, how, uh, how geeky you get with respect to solar system bodies and NASA's ever increasing list of, of missions. Uh, so I just want to give you a little bit of info about Da Vinci and then talk about the, the, you know, the big questions that we're going to be able to address and hopefully answer which will then in turn, of course, lead to more questions as any good scientific uh, investigation does uh, through this mission. So Da Vinci um, is, is a combination probe and flyby carrier spacecraft. So basically we'll have a spacecraft that flies by Venus a few times and it has a probe on it that it will boop, release and that will go descending through the atmosphere. And the entire investigation, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the instruments that we're gonna carry, some of the big questions we wanna uh, answer uh, so we're going to go through the atmosphere, we're going to interrogate the atmosphere and the surface to try to get those essential measurements that we need to understand terrestrial planet formation and the um, possibilities for habitability in both our solar system and beyond. So most people, when they think about NASA missions, right, it's like, ooh, Mars, right, the flagship's up there, Perseverance just went up and they got the cute little helicopter going around. Those are flagship missions. Curiosity, the other uh, mission that Dr. Hummels mentioned that I'm on, that was a flagship mission. It's still going. After a decade, we're still roving around. These are the big scale missions that Congress basically says, you will do this, and here's some money. And they typically cost, you know, maybe let's, let's just say ballpark $3 billion, right? So there are two other classes of missions below that. One is called New Frontiers, and that's like in the $1 billion price range. Uh, you may have heard of Dragonfly. It's an octocopter rotorcraft that's going to go to Titan, this moon of Saturn that has a hydrologic cycle like Earth, except it's not water, it's methane, crazy. They're going to fly around and check out things. 
Then there's like the cheapo version. God, this is being recorded, so my teammates are going to see this. It's not true. Cheapo means $500 million, and that's discovery class. And Da Vinci is a discovery class mission. So we write a big proposal, we compete with other proposal, uh, other mission concepts, and ultimately we were selected in, um, gosh, we started in 2019 for this, we were selected in 2021, along with Veritas, which is another um, Venus related mission. Uh, that one's being led out of JPL, Da Vinci's being led out of Goddard, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. So I'll show you a little bit of slides uh, that have some information about Da Vinci, but there's probably questions out there that I won't be able to answer because only so much of the information has been cleared for public release at this stage of the game. So, you know, want, want, sorry, in advance, if you want to know something, I just can't tell you. Stay tuned, basically. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, so that's, I think, a good overview. Oh, and by the way, when the probe hits the atmosphere, we've got an hour. Uh, of descent. So you know how Mars has like those seven minutes of terror when it's like, oh my God, are we going to land on the surface or smush the rover? Yeah, we have 60 minutes. So that'll be fun. All right. So let's orient ourselves, right? We're going to the terrestrial planets. So obviously these are not to scale distance wise. That would be quite interesting, uh, but they are uh, to scale by size. And so I think what I think we tend to not consider is just how similar Earth and Venus are to one another. We're always thinking about Mars as that other terrestrial planet, but Mars is pretty wimpy. Uh, sorry, not sorry, Mars. And there's not much love for Mercury, alas. Uh, some people love Mercury, but we're gonna focus on, on, uh, on Venus today because Venus is often referred to as Earth's sister planet. So I've just thrown up a bunch of, of bulk properties. So like planet, whole planet properties uh, for comparison between Venus and Earth. Um, and I've got the like units, so there's kilometers and miles. Sorry, we're all going with SI units here. Um, you see the gravity is pretty similar. The density is pretty similar because we're made out of basically the same stuff. The length of a year, of course, Venus is shorter because it's closer to the sun. So yeah, okay, we cool. We got this little sister planet. Why do we not talk about her more? Oh, wait, but is she in fact our evil twin? Wahaha, because holy crap, look at some of those other bulk properties down there now, right? The length of a day on Venus is actually about 243 Earth days. The surface temperature, a nice blazing almost 900 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, as opposed to the nice balmy 60 degrees Fahrenheit on Earth. Again, these are average temperatures, right? We had a really hot day here in LA today. Surface pressure, you know, we're good on Earth you'd be smushed basically on, on Venus. And the atmosphere is of course quite different. And part of you know, the fact that Venus is so hot and so much, it's basically a pressure cooker at the surface. This is a pretty good reason as to why we haven't sent rovers there yet because everything basically gets cooked and crushed in sort of short order. So just for analogy, that surface pressure of Venus is basically if you would dive down a kilometer into the ocean. You'd have to go up 50 kilometers into Venus's atmosphere to get to like an Earth pressure. So it's, it's pretty nuts. Uh, oh, right. And let's not forget the sulfuric acid in the atmosphere because everybody loves uh, raining drops of battery acid on them. Now you can see why maybe it's a little hard to get to Venus and do things at Venus. And yet the times they are changing. So we like to, you know, back to Venus shirt, uh, Venusians on Earth like to talk about the decade of Venus. So I mentioned, of course, that NASA selected Da Vinci and Veritas. Uh, this next slide is totally uh, garbled because it's a PDF that I tried to drop into a PowerPoint. But if you Google decade of Venus uh, or, or try to go you know, visiting Venus, basically in the next decade or so, NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency, ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, they actually have uh, Atasuki up there now, uh, the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, all of these agencies are planning to send missions to Venus if they haven't already. Uh, so we're going to learn a lot about our next door neighbor that has been neglected for far too long. And by far too long, the last time that NASA sent an in-situ probe to Venus was the Pioneer Venus mission in 1978. So yeah, it's what year is it again? It's 2022. And based on just timelines of how long, missions take a long time to come to fruition. Uh, you know, once you get selected, you've got a lot of work to do to get to the point where you can get that spacecraft on the rocket and get it up there. 
So at the moment, we're looking at probably we'll get to Venus around 2030. And that doesn't mean it's going to take eight years to get there. It's going to take eight years-ish to build all the things and incorporate all the things into the spacecraft and get it to the pad and get it up there and have it do its flybys. You get the idea. So it's, it's, a, it's a big commitment, uh, it turns out. OK, big questions. What The biggest question here, Venus and Earth, kind of sisters, kind of evil twins. I guess that makes Venus the left twin. If you're a Simpsons fan, you'll get the reference. Uh, right, OK, so why, this is the question, why did Venus and Earth diverge? So scientists have long hypothesized you know, that Venus and Earth started in very similar states when they coalesced and accreted in the solar nebula. But then they followed these crazy different evolutionary paths, right? And, and you can see the sort of the backdrop of that slide, right? There's this nice sort of ambient, comfortable, water-rich world. And then on the other side, you got this lovely rocky uh, sulfuric acid-rich hellscape. Woohoo! So how did it get from where it was to there, given that we got to here and we're still good? And that is a very big question in terms of looking forward, in terms of understanding terrestrial planet evolution, in terms of understanding what we might be observing when we start looking uh, in more detail at exoplanets as JWST comes online. But it's also important to think about looking backwards in terms of habitability, right? Was Venus, did Venus ever have oceans on it? There's some evidence to suggest yes, but it's, and it's tantalizing evidence, but we really need more data to, to be able to take a better stand on, uh, on that question. There's just so much, you know, we don't know. And it, it begs the question, why haven't we been back to Venus? Well, I just told you, it's crazy difficult to, to send probes in there. And also Mars takes all everybody's attention. Mars, Mars, Mars. I love Mars, but we've been neglecting a planet that in many ways has just as much information to share, just as big a story to share with us. So I told you I'd talk about Da Vinci, right? So we're looking at answering some big questions that sort of fall under that scope uh, of the two big ones that I, that I put uh, on the previous slide. So did the inner planets form from similar materials? Probably based on theories and, and models of how, um, how the solar system formed and what we know from meteorites and other things like that. But there's more to explore. Did Venus have an early ocean? If it did, where is it now? When did Venus become dry and hot? You know, this hellscape that it is at the moment. And how was volcanism involved in all of that, uh, in all of that process? You know, there are a lot of things tied together here, all of which da Vinci is going to probe, excuse me, largely through atmospheric chemistry. So when we start to descend through the atmosphere, we'll be making hundreds of measurements of the atmospheric composition. And just as an example, one way that we can look at atmospheric origins and evolution and the volcanic history is to uh, measure the, the abundances of the noble gases. So helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, uh, those guys, because they're inert, they can be used to trace origins as well as the evolution of a planet's volatiles, right? The gaseous species. Did Venus have a, a giant impact that blew off its original atmosphere? The noble gases will help us understand that. Huge question, right? Where's the water? Where did it go? People talk about this all the time with Mars, right? Like Mars, Mars, Mars. Mars had a lot of water on it at one point. Okay, but what about Venus? Well, if we assume we all started at the same place and we look at Mars, we say, yeah, Mars lost a lot of water. How do we know that? One of the things we do is look at the isotope ratio uh, of deuterium to hydrogen in water or in the, the planet's atmosphere. So this is a quick primer on isotopes. It's all hydrogen at the end of the day, right? So go back to your gen, your gen chem class, your high school class, right? An element, uh, you got the same number of protons here, but a different number of neutrons. So hydrogen, the hydrogen we think of, uh, one proton. Deuterium, same proton, but now it has a neutron in the nucleus. And that deuterium is, as you can see on the slide, a teeny tiny percent of all the hydrogen. And yet, on a planetary body that's, that's lost its water, there's a signature that we can read in the atmosphere, and that is this D to H ratio. And why does that happen? Water in the atmosphere, the sun photochemically breaks the bonds, the hydrogen gravitationally and diffuse, it diffuses away and gravitationally escapes. 
but the deuterium is heavier and moves slower. And so it gets retained for longer. And so the bigger this D to H ratio is, the more water relative to Earth's volume of water has been lost. So this is a huge question. Mars, it has about five times the D to H ratio of Earth. Venus, it could be hundreds. So big question out there. A couple other things that we're looking at, uh, surface geology, right? So continents are, again, with this question of habitability, right? Where are there continents on Venus, remnant continents, just like the continental crust on Earth? When you build continents on Earth, one of the dominant ways is to basically have te plate tectonic subduction zones where you've got some water, you've got melting of a crust, of a basaltic crust, and you create something more like granite, for example. Um, so if we find rocks that are kind of like uh, granites on Venus, that could be evidence of, again, water, maybe plate tectonics. Uh, again, that sort of early planetary evolution. We're going to be getting high resolution descent imaging from our cameras on Da Vinci, uh, and that will help us get topography. So are there raised up continents relative to some baseline? That's a, that's a false color image of Hawaii, a digital elevation model, which is how we look at basically uh, topographic changes. So we'll be getting maps like that uh, that we can coordinate with NASA's other mission on. And we will also be taking spectroscopic measurements. So basically we'll be looking through the atmosphere on our flybys with some instruments, and we'll be looking at the surface with our probe instruments as we drop down the surface. And we'll be looking at different in different wavelengths of, uh, of light. And so I know that the figure there is all squiggly and stuff, but the point of that is that different minerals, because that's what is corresponds to each of those lines, Different minerals have different shapes uh, in these in in this space, you know, in this spectral space. And so, depending on what we see in that kind of a plot, we can say, "Aha! It was this kind of rock or this kind of rock." And then, finally, the weathering regime at the surface. This is basically where we'll look at that trace gases, so reactive gases like sulfur dioxide and uh, and other other species like that that are interacting with the rocks. Um, and we are going to try to understand how the rocks in the atmosphere interact to try to map out things like Venus's sulfur cycle. So I know I'm getting close to the end, um, but I just want to give you a few slides on the mission itself. So I said that we would be doing two flybys of, uh, of Venus. So we launch, we go by Venus twice. In those two flybys, we'll be doing a lot of imaging of the surface on Venus's night side and of the clouds. And then on the second one, we'll release a probe and the probe will descend through the atmosphere. And as the probe is descending through the atmosphere, it's going to be making a lot of measurements, both chemical measurements using a mass spectrometer and what's a tunable laser spectrometer. So these are just instruments that can measure the chemical composition, the isotopic composition of the gases as we descend. Uh, we're also going to be taking pictures uh, and getting those digital elevation models, as well as some spectral information from Vendi, this descent imager. We've got VASI on the, on the probe, which will basically get us temperature, pressure, those sorts of parameters, so we can really map out the atmospheric column. And then, super cool, we've got a student-led project uh, called VFOX, and it's a little sensor that we're going to stick on the probe, and it will measure effectively how much oxygen is in the atmosphere, especially as we get close to the surface. So we don't really know a lot. That's the point of this is that a lot of, of interesting stuff is happening in the lower atmosphere. And the closest we got from NASA was Pioneer Venus, which you can see is still way up there in the clouds. Uh, a lot of landers um, from Russia made it to the surface. And you should Google uh, the Venera landers for an image of Venus's surface that they were able to take before they basically were you know, smushed. Um, but, but yeah, this is, this is the idea that we'll be able to connect the atmosphere to the surface and try to understand this bigger picture question of habitability. Were there oceans on Venus? How long might they have lasted? Is this typical for terrestrial planet evolution? And if so, what does that imply for exoplanets that we see with these space-based telescopes that have atmospheric compositions similar in a lot of ways to Venus, are close to their primary stars uh, and, and are of the right size, mass, et cetera, to potentially be a rocky, Earth-like, Venus-like planet.
And so at the end of the day, right, this is about habitability using a neighbor that we've long neglected. It's okay, Mars, we still love you, but Venus is the next place to, to really delve. Uh, like I said, this is the Da Vinci mission. It's led out of Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Jim Garvin is our principal investigator. And we've got a bunch of, of partners, both academic and other centers like JPL. Okay, and I went a little long, sorry. I, I'm done now. <laughs> no worries at all. That was wonderful. That was really, yeah, super interesting stuff. I learned a bunch of stuff too. Um, and, and it sounds like we already have questions from our audience. But before we get started, I'm going to use moderator privileges and ask my own question first. Um, so you talked about the sulfur cycle at the end there. Um, is I mean, obviously, when I think of sulf sulfuric acid, I think of it being is this very, you know, nasty, erosive uh, uh, substance. But I know that under certain conditions, oxygen can be very similarly corrosive. Um, do we find, I mean, do we expect that environment to be worse for the, the surface processes and for the materials that are on the surface of, of Venus relative to the presence of oxygen and the other gases that we have here? Yeah, so actually that's a big outstanding question. So here's a case where immediately it's a, we don't know. And the reason that we don't, we can, we can make models of what we think the atmospheric composition is down, uh, down through the atmosphere. And depending on the assumptions we make and the chemical species we put into those models, we can say, well, we think maybe this is what it's like near the surface, in which case, you know, you would have a lot of oxidation um, and it would affect the types of minerals that you see, which is partially why we want to send this student collaborative, um, the student collaboration down to, to the surface. But the sulfuric acid Definitely, we know, right, that that's up in the in the cloud area in the aerosols. So there's a lot happening between the aerosol layer where we know there are these sulfuric acid droplets and the surface where we're like, meh, un unclear. And okay. so getting that will be really helpful. I see. And Da Vinci will potentially be able to answer these sorts of questions. We'll be able to answer like the zeroth order, right? Okay, we just okay. need more questions, which means give us another mission. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't express this uh, formally. If you guys have questions, please feel free to answer them or ask them. Well, you can answer them too, but uh, to ask them in the um, in the comment section, either on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or wherever you're watching this, we already have a number there. Uh, let's see. How about? A question from Chris Georgi, uh, given the significantly increased surface pressure and different atmospheric chemistry, what mineralogical differences would you expect to see? Um, and would you expect near parity to Earth's? I guess that's kind of like a, an extension of what? Sure, sure. At the end. So there are, there are enigmatic features on the surface of Venus, some of which are called tesserae that look potentially like they could be continental or have experienced processes similar to what we have in some of Earth's continents. Uh, mineralogically speaking, we're, well, back up. There are also many volcanic plains, right? And there have been a lot, there's been a lot of work recently to suggest that Venus may still be uh, volcanically active, in which case you're going to have basaltic type lava flows on the surface. So very similar to Earth. Um, tossing around rock names here for folks who might not be familiar, think Hawaii, basically. So you'd have these kind of basaltic lava flows um, with carbon dioxide and some of these other noxious sulfur gases spewed out. What's happening at the surface, like Dr. Hummels just asked, is a big question. We can only see through the atmosphere in certain windows, wavelength windows, which really limits our ability from orbiting spacecraft or flyby spacecraft to figure out what's down there. We know there are iron rich things down there. Um, we hypothesize about certain sulfur rich species. Are there things like carbonates on the surface? That would be incredibly interesting for understanding how the CO2 in the atmosphere is interacting, especially since we don't know if there's, is there any water in the subsurface? All I'm doing is asking more questions on top of your question. Biggest answer, similar to earth because of similar building blocks, but like you, like you asked, the chemistry is so different that it's a little bit difficult to, to envision 
like I said, people hypothesize, but hopefully we'll get some ground truth in when we get there. Let's see, there's another in between various media here. Uh, Sophie Shen asks, how long is the probe going to last on the surface? Great question. Right, so when you design a mission for NASA, this is gonna be a, a roundabout answer, but I will answer it. When you design a mission for NASA, you basically say, here are the require, here are the science questions we wanna answer. Here are the measurements we need. Here are the requirements in order to get those measurements, to get those answers. And anything you do beyond that is bonus. So the probe, the descent sphere, we have no requirement for it to survive after it hits the surface. And it's gonna be coming in at, uh, a little fast. That being said, based on all the work our engineering team has done and tests that they've run with like materials and what we think the surface right pressure and temperature are, it can probably last for about another 15 minutes and would continue to collect data all of which I should say get sent back to that carrier spacecraft that'll be that'll be up there receiving the data, bouncing that back to it. Excellent. Can I, can I steal a question? Yeah. Absolutely. Jump that, in. Yeah. So are there environments on Earth that um, kind of inform how you would design a probe to survive in that sort of environment? Whoa, that is a great question. There are definitely environments that people use kind of like as analogs to Venus surface environments, but only like topographically or geologically Like speaking. a deep sea vent or something like that? I mean, that's the I, only thing I can think that would have yeah, a Yeah, well, that pressure. kilometer down, right? You have to go a kilometer down to the ocean. So that is getting down towards some of the, some of the vents. That is a great, that's a great question. I, now I want to go back and ask our engineering team. I think I see them Thursday. Uh, you know, did they do underwater testing to get to the pressure, the temperature and the, um, they, they probably put it in what's called a therm vac chamber, which is a, a, a chamber that has very, it's made out of metal, very thick walls. You can basically scale it to the pressure, temperature, other conditions that you need to prove that your material won't fail. So I'm sure they did that, but that's, you know, in the laboratory as opposed to where would you go on earth? Um, a couple of questions related to the Russian Venera probes mm -hmm. from uh, a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. One from Stephen Trier, how are Russia's historic Venera probes constructed to survive long enough to transmit pictures to Earth? Um, but also there was another question about um, could microorganisms from Earth survived on the Venera probes you know, I know we have like these uh, extremophiles, organisms that can in, can survive in really extreme environments where most organisms would fail either due to temperature or pressure or radiation or what have you. Right. Um, what do you think? Well, so I don't know enough about the Venera architecture to answer the first question. Apologies. Right. I'm not even sure if that information is available. It publicly, may not be, right? especially now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything uh, and, and there really were, I mean, they, it's like a snapshot. It's a panorama from the front side and a panorama from the back side of one of the landers. Several of them took pictures. Um, one of them you can see is kind of crushed a little bit too. So Lord only knows how long it lasted. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know the technical details. I'm curious, but yeah, I suspect, you know, trade secrets kind of things, proprietary information. Um, in terms of a microbe surviving, so we care a lot about planetary protection, right? And, and that's the do no harm, you know, it's not quite the prime directive, but it's, you know, don't, don't contaminate other places with earth crap, uh, at least living earth crap. Um, and we go to a lot of... Um, we do a lot of work to make sure that we sterilize everything that's going to come in contact with a planetary surface or an atmosphere. Uh, that includes heating the heck out of stuff. That includes often it's called dry heat microbial reduction. It includes washes in like pretty concentrated hydrogen peroxide. I don't know what the Russians did, but NASA certainly has a, a, a set of requirements that you have to treat the spacecraft. And that changes depending on where you go, like Europa Clipper, which is going to Europa, the moon of Jupiter, that has a thick ice shell overlying a, an, under, an ocean that's more voluminous than all of Earth's and it's been around probably for 4 billion years. Like you do a lot of different things there, even more stringent than Mars. 
it's hard to imagine something surviving the descent, depending on the velocity that it came through, right? You could reach potentially some supersonic, uh, you know, flow fields as you're descending. I don't know, again, when they release the parachute and all of that, but you've got the heat just from entering the atmosphere and, and breaking, however the breaking is happening, you know, your surface is getting cooked. If you pop off a shell, then if something's caught in the interior and isn't exposed to that heat and pressure or the ambient environment, which is of course sulfuric acid and other nasty stuff, maybe like, like Dr. Hummel said, extremophiles on earth, we are discovering them in all kinds of places that are more and more extreme temperature, pressure, salinity wise, I'm not a microbiologist, uh, so I'm not sure where the bounds of life really are. I suspect it's highly unlikely. And even if the microbe survived, would it be able to ex persist? Because yeah, it's, like it, it would evolve for Earth, right? Or would it it be sterile Earth, or yeah, right. all of these exactly. things. Exactly. So even if it made it, it probably got cooked not long, not long after or had right. no friends to, you know, it was make probably more. not like repopulating the surface of Venus with some sort of bacterium that was uh, found here, hopefully. I, I won't. Yeah, never mind. I'm not going <laughs> to. There are many hypotheses about life in the clouds of Venus, but I'm not I'm not going there unless uh, unless someone forces me. Don't force me. OK, I, I won't force you. Um, it Well, I guess. Will the Da Vinci mission be able to investigate anything further on the presence in the clouds of the detection of um, phosphine? Phosphine, yes. That was made, what, two years ago? At this point, yeah, it grieves it all, right? Um, so I have to be careful how I answer this. Okay. So the, the best answers. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. So one of the instruments we're flying that I'm actually helping build uh, has the capacity to add an extra, some extra components that's above and beyond what we told NASA we would do. And often when those things happen, it's like, well, it's going to cost more money. And you might not even be able to do it because maybe it'll just tip the scales and make the spacecraft too heavy. You think, what, a single component? No, no, no. There's all kinds of electronics and boards and other things that have to be, you know, it's a significant into investment in time and money. Right. So hypothetically, we could potentially augment one of our instruments to look for phosphine, pH three, but that is not a part of the mission's plan at the moment. We will be talking to the scientific community more about it to see how much interest there is in it. And then, then it's up to NASA headquarters, whether they want to whether they would be interested and then whether it's even feasible to do. And just, I guess, to give our audience a little context, if they aren't familiar with this, there was a, a press release that came out a couple of years ago um, by uh, a prominent planetary scientist uh, claim and, and team claiming that they had detected a, a, a molecule called phosphine. Correct me where I get this wrong, but I'll, I'll try here. Um, detecting phosphine, which is a molecule that is only thought to exist, at least under the conditions where it was detected in Venus, um, produced by life, produced by organisms. Although I think, I thought in Jupiter's um, uh, geochemistry, right. or not geochemistry, Jupiter's chemistry, you could produce it under different conditions. But yeah, very reducing need... conditions. Okay. You need a lot of hydrogen gas, and Venus's atmosphere doesn't have that. Um, and, and the key point that you said was on Earth, we know that we think, actually, we don't even know that much about phosphine on Earth. We, we, we know it's generated and it seems to be associated with microbes. But the key piece is that it shouldn't, it's what we call a disequilibrium species. So that just means that it should be broken down almost immediately in the Venusian atmosphere. So if it's there, why is it there? And how long does it last? And if it lasts long enough to make these observations, where's it coming from? I see. So... It could be at least why it made such a splash because new molecules are, well, maybe not, I don't know. I imagine new, new molecules are detected in other planetary bodies, probably not too infrequently, but, but in this case, it was associated with a byproduct of life. And so it was like, oh, is this the first glimpse that we've had of potentially life existing, you know, a biomarker of, of, of life existing somewhere else than, than Earth, yep. which of course is like potentially one of the most historic discoveries of 
all time. Um, it would be. But then there was, you know, some met with some criticism after the fact in terms of the data analysis and all of that. But given that you guys are going to Venus, this seems like an apt thing to potentially look for, given that yeah. it could be. I mean, it's an example of how science works, right? They present an interpretation of data. Other people say, nah, we think you did this wrong and here's why. Right. And now we have a chance to sort of test that hypothesis by collecting data right there in situ. Whether it happens or not, don't know, stay tuned, but yeah. Cool, um, well, yeah, I've, we've, I've, I've bounced a lot of questions off you. Thank you for being so patient and thank our audience. Um, Max, sorry, I. I, we went to town on that with lots of Q&A. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman, for your uh, presentation and for answering all of our and my questions. Um, okay, we will move on to Max Goldberg. Uh, do you wanna share your screen, Max? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, yeah, look, it looks great. It's beautiful slides, man. This looks great. Um, okay, so Max Goldberg is a graduate student in astrophysics at Caltech. Using computer simulations and telescope observations, he studies how systems of planets outside our solar system form and evolve. Excuse me. In addition, he enjoys skiing and playing the piano, particularly ragtime and jazz. Oh, man, if I'd known this, I would have had you do some sort of, some sort of little performance for us. That sounds awesome. Ragtime music's pretty sweet. Doing a talk. You know, yeah. I'm gonna double up. I guess that's I guess there's only so many things you can commit to. Um, all right, I'll let you I'll let you go from there. Thanks, Max. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, and uh, it was a great talk by by Dr. Hoffman. And he was talking a lot about what you know the future has for for space missions. But I want to talk a little bit about the history of, of astronomy and what has been discovered before, and, and in particular, uh, what's been so amazing about measuring the time of, of things in space and and how they they proceed over time. Really, for, for thousands of years, people have looked to the sky to decide you know, when to sow seeds and when to harvest their crops um, and even when to go to war. Uh, I won't start thousands of years ago. I'm going to start, I said, 400 years ago uh, when Galileo first pointed a telescope at the, the sky. And so one of the first things that Galileo looked at was Jupiter, which is uh, one of the brightest planets in the sky. It's very prominent. And what Galileo um, saw is he, a few points of light around Jupiter. And uh, over the next couple of days, he kept observing it and he saw these, these points move around. So sometimes there were some on, on one side of Jupiter and sometimes they were on the other side. And he recorded this, this data here of the points that he saw. And, uh, and he realized within a couple of weeks that these, these dots were actually objects that were orbiting Jupiter. So they were going on little circles around Jupiter and there were four of them. Uh, we, these are their modern names, not what Galileo called them, but we call them the Galilean moons and the they are, there's Io, which orbits Jupiter in 1.8 days, Europa in 3.6, Ganymede in 7.2, and then uh, Callisto in 16.7 in days. And so these, these moons go on these very regular orbits um, around Jupiter. And this is an amazing discovery for a lot of reasons. Um, but what I want to talk about is, is the fact that Galileo was looking at a, a clock in the sky. Um, and so this is something that like, I think Galileo would have realized immediately because he actually invented the, the pendulum clock. And I think he would have been pretty familiar with um, timekeeping. Um, but so this had really practical implications immediately. And the reason was that in the 1600s when this was discovered, um, so these are the, the moons of, of Jupiter. So you, you really wanted to know where you were um, in the age, in this age of exploration. So there are lots of people on boats traveling all across the world, and they wanted to know uh, where they were on Earth um, without, you know, they didn't have GPS or, and even the, the maps were not so accurate. Um, so finding your latitude on Earth is actually pretty straightforward. So latitude is, is how far you are north and south of the equator. Um, that's pretty easy because you can just look for the North Star. So if the North Star is directly overhead, then you're at the North Pole. If the North Star is 45 degrees above the horizon, then your, 45, your latitude is 45 degrees. Um, but finding your longitude is, is much harder. So longitude is how far east and, and west you are. And the problem with longitude is that the Earth rotates. And so if you, if you sort of move over, um, then you're in the same position than a little bit later when the Earth has, has rotated and moved it into place. So you can't just look at the stars and see where they are relative to the horizon um, and calculate your longitude, unless you know what time it is. So if you know what time it is, um, then you can, because the sky rotates uh, overnight, 
you can look at where the stars are at, and uh, where they should be given the time and use that to calculate your longitude. Um, unfortunately, calculating the time is, was actually really hard in the 1600s. So there were some accurate clocks, particularly in churches, for example, but these are huge clocks, right? And uh, even a pendulum clock doesn't really work on a boat because the boat is kind of swinging back and forth. Um, so Galileo realized that Jupiter's moons were a clock in the sky um, that was calibrated for everyone. So what you could do is you could take, uh, if you had a book of when the movements of the moons of Jupiter would happen, so in particular, they were looking for the innermost moon passing in front of Jupiter. You have a book saying when that happens, and then you have a telescope and you look for it. And when that happens, you write down what time it is and you use that to, to synchronize your clock. And then you can calculate your longitude by measuring some stars um, and calculate it from there. And so you can figure out where you are. But the clock has to be accurate because if you're, say, the clock is, say, like 20 minutes off, then you're going to be off by like 300 miles. So it's really important that the clock had to be really, really accurate. Um, so this was a really cool discovery that, that really had practical implications. Um, so one person who, who started working on this in the, the late 1600s was a Danish astronomer named Ola Romer. And so in Copenhagen, he was uh, observing this, the motions of, of Jupiter's moons and uh, recording the times. And his collaborator Cassini in uh, Paris was doing the same thing in Paris. And so they were uh, recording very precisely the motions of Jupiter's moons. And, and Galileo's technique was rather, uh, rather successful for this. Um, and then Roma moved to Paris and he began to observe um, the eclipses of Avio in front of Jupiter from Paris. Um, but that's where he noticed the problem. So they had started to write you know, tables of when the uh, Io would pass in front of Jupiter precisely, and then they would actually observe that. And what Romer found was that these, uh, the passes of, of Io in front of Jupiter were happening a little bit off of their predictions. So sometimes they would happen a little early, like 10 minutes early, and other times they would happen a little late. And, and Romer's uh, really amazing realization was that these differences were happening um, because of the, the position of Earth within its orbit. So uh, Romer realized that the eclipses happened early, or sorry, they happened late when Earth was on the other side of the sun uh, from where Jupiter was. And then they happened early when Earth was on the same side of the sun as where Jupiter was. And the difference was about 20 minutes. Uh, and the, the really amazing discovery by Romer was that this would all make sense if light took time to cross uh, Earth's orbit. So at the time, people thought that light was instantaneous. So any attempt to measure the speed of light had completely failed. It seemed like it was something that happened immediately. But Roma realized that if light took uh, 20 minutes, 22 mi minutes to cross Earth's orbit from the top to the bottom, then it would explain these um, measurements that were off. Why he was getting sometimes the information early and sometimes it was late it was because the light was simply getting to him earlier uh, when Earth was closer to Jupiter. And, uh, it was taking longer when Earth was farther away. So this was a really groundbreaking discovery. Um, and really, there wasn't any good measurement of, of the speed of light for like a, another 100 years. So it was really um, an incredible thing. OK, so that's the first story of, of the importance of, of clocks in astronomy. And so let's jump forward about 200 years um, to Harvard Observatory in the early 1900s. So a group of women at Harvard who were called the Harvard Computers at the time um, we're looking really closely into stars in our local, uh, around our, us in our local universe. And they're measuring really precisely what these stars look like and how bright they were, taking tons and tons of images um, from the telescopes there. So one, uh, one of these astronomers in particular, Henrietta Swan-Levitt, was looking at a type of star called the Cepheid variable. So uh, variable stars are ones that, that change in brightness. And Cepheids uh, go up and down in brightness in a very smooth pattern. And it takes some amount of time for them to get brighter and dimmer, um, which can be anywhere, anywhere from a couple of days to several weeks or even several months. And uh, what Levitt discovered rather incredibly was that there was a perfect relationship between um, how long it took for the star to get bright and dim and how bright the star actually was. Um, so she, she drew these, these plots here. Um, so the, the bottom you have the period of the brightness. So how long does it take for one cycle of brightening and then dimming? Um, and then on the y-axis uh, up and down is how bright the star is. Um, so this is a, now a, another celestial clock. So these stars were, are uh, contracting and expanding and changing their brightness in a very precise time. And now you can go from one to the other in terms of uh, how long that takes and how bright the star is. So if you see how bright it is, you can estimate how long it'll take 
um, to change in brightness. And then if you measure how long it takes, you can estimate how bright it is. But actually, this is really important because in astronomy, it's really hard to measure how far away things are. That's because if you have something that's very faint, it's not clear that it's faint because it's really far away or because it just intrinsically doesn't produce a lot of light. Um, but the Cepheids fix this problem because we know how much light they produce because of this calibration curve um, that Levin had created. Um, so the first astronomer to really uh, work on this and, and make a major discovery with Cepheids was Ed Edwin Hubble. So Hubble was using the 100-inch uh, telescope at Mount Wilson, which is a few miles from Caltech. And he was taking um, images of some nearby, what they called at the time, spiral nebulae. So there were all these big uh, spiral-shaped objects in the sky. And there was a debate at the time in astronomy of whether these objects were just gaseous clouds in our galaxy, which some nebulae are, or whether they were really distant objects that were more like um, their own galaxies. So Hubble was looking at um, this Andromeda Nebula, and he, he realized that one of these stars um, that you could actually see in the telescope uh, appeared to be getting brighter and then dimmer and then brighter and then dimmer. And he actually, originally he thought this was a nova, which is why it's labeled N on this photographic plate. Um, but then, so nova means it, it, it's a new star, it gets bright, um, and then it dims, but then it, it got bright again. And so they realized this was not a nova, it's actually a variable star. And in fact, it was a Cepheid. So that he immediately realized that this was really important um, because you could measure how long it took for this Cepheid in Andromeda to get brighter and dimmer, which was about 30 days. Um, and then you can measure how bright this uh, Cepheid star was in Andromeda. And it turns out that it was really faint. Um, so back to, to uh, Levitt's curve here, we have this, this calibrated curve of where um, how bright the Cepheid is versus how long it takes to brighten and dim. Um, but here's the one that Hubble found. It's all the way at the bottom. Um, so it takes about 30 days, but it's way dimmer than all the ones that Levitt had observed. The reason why it's so dim is because it's so far away. So uh, actually it's about the star that Hubble was observing was about 10 times further away than uh, all the stars that Levitt was observing. And actually the ones that Levitt were observing were already on the outskirts of the Milky Way in the small Magellanic Cloud. Um, so actually, Hubble realized that Andromeda was extremely far away. It was well outside of the Milky Way. And also because Andromeda is big on the sky, it takes up, it's bigger than the moon. Um, and this meant that Andromeda was huge. In fact, it's you know, as big or even bigger than the Milky Way. So it was just this one star and this one observation, Hubble expanded the size of the universe by a factor of 10, um, by realizing that this clock, uh, this Cepheid that had this, this perfect pulse of 30 days, um, told him exactly how far away Andromeda was, and it was really far. Okay, um, so let's now skip forward to uh, the second half of the 20th century. So uh, tech improved quite a lot during this time, and, and uh, radio astronomy really benefited quite a lot from this. Um, so a, a grad student in Cambridge named Jocelyn Bell Burnell was working on this radio telescope near Cambridge, UK. And uh, as with a lot of radio telescopes here, it's just kind of bunch of poles and wires, uh, but this was really state-of-the-art equipment. And uh, she was looking at some of the data coming through in the late 70s, and, and she started to see a kind of unusual signal. Um, so this, there's a lot of unusual signals in radio astronomy data because you know, microwave ovens and cars produce radio waves that mess with the telescopes. But this one was, was weirder because it kept pulsing um, about every second. And it really seemed like it was coming from space. Uh, and actually, uh, Bill Brunel and her advisor, Anthony Hewish, uh, actually thought that these maybe were aliens that were transmitting some radio signals down to Earth. Um, but then they discovered a couple of other of these objects, uh, that these pulsing objects uh, in other places in the sky. And so it really seemed like these were just astrophysical objects that are, that are blinking. And within a couple of years, it became clear what they were. And uh, so these objects eventually were called pulsars. And it turns out that they're neutron stars. So neutron stars are these very dense remnants of uh, very massive stars that have exploded. They've gone supernova and they've left behind this dense remnant of neutrons. And uh, because it, the, they started from very large stars um, and then contracted to be really small, like the neutron star is just the size of a city really. Um, these stars spin really fast and they have very strong magnetic fields. And magnetic fields energize a jet of um, plasma which emits brightly in, in radio waves. 
but the star is spinning around. And so it acts kind of like a lighthouse where it has a beam and this beam sometimes sweeps into our view and causes a flash. And so you get these very regular flashes of radio um, coming from the star. And so this was the source of, of these alien signals. It's really just an astrophysical object. And so the first pulsars that were discovered blinked about once a second, but it turns out uh, they can be much faster. So some of them blink hundreds of times a second. And uh, as astronomers observe them longer and longer, they realize that these objects are amazingly good clocks. So they, they just really pulse exactly at their preferred period with a few exceptions. Um, even if you compare them, you time them to atomic clocks, um, some pulsars really are, are at that level of accuracy. And so we can record from the radio telescopes uh, very precisely when are these flashes coming. And uh, maybe you've seen this, this before. This is a, a famous album cover. This is a pulsar signal. So this is a uh, one of the earliest pulsars uh, discovered by Jocelyn Bell Bunel. And these regular pulses coming in um, at a very precise time. So uh, by the late 90s, or the, the, sorry, the early 90s, uh, astronomers were really measuring uh, thousands of pulsars very precisely. So uh, one in particular, one astronomer was uh, Alexander Wolschan, and he was working at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And he was looking at uh, these very fast pulsars that emit pulses 100 times a second. And he was checking to see whether they were really coming on time. And uh, it turns out that one of them wasn't really. And so there was one in particular that caught his interest. It's PSR 1257 plus 12. Astronomers are very creative in naming objects. Um, so this one had signals that over a few years, sometimes the signals were coming early and sometimes they were coming late. We've heard that story before. Um, but now instead of 20 minutes, this was about two milliseconds. So these are very uh, small changes in the arrival times. But you can measure these really accurately because you're getting so many pulses, hundreds of times a second, the pulses are coming. And so you can trace out this curve, which has a very particular shape here. Um, so we've already removed the, the movement of the Earth here. So we don't have Romer's problem here where Earth is moving. And so the light has to travel across Earth's orbit. Um, so instead, something else is changing. And so it has to be that the, the actual position of the pulsar itself is changing. So now the pulsar is wobbling back and forth enough to cause um, these delays in the propagation of this, this pulse to us. Um, and so two milliseconds is about uh, a thousand miles of light. Um, and so as we know that now this pulsar is, is wobbling back and forth by about a thousand miles. So why would it do that? Um, so you can think about Earth uh, orbiting the sun. So Earth orbits because of the sun's gravity, but actually Earth's gravity is exerted on the sun too. So the sun feels the gravity of Earth and the sun wobbles a bit and it kind of orbits um, a point in space that uh, is a very small orbit because of Earth. And if you just look at the sun and you see its wobble, you can actually discover Earth because you can realize that something is pulling on the sun um, to make the sun wobble around and, uh, and discover the, you know, the planet Earth. And so what Walshan uh, realized was that that's what this was. So this uh, pulsar is, is wobbling back and forth. And the reason why it's wobbling is because it's being orbited by planets. Um, so this signal is kind of complicated. It's because there are actually two planets orbiting the pulsar, uh, one in 67 days, the other one in 98 days. And they each create this sort of sinusoidal signal, uh, which is because of the pulsar wobbling back and forth and the light taking a little longer or a little shorter um, to reach us because of the motion of the pulsar. Um, so these are actually the first detection of planets outside of our solar system in 1992. So you may have heard a few years ago, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of extrasolar planets. Um, that was not to Wolshan, that was actually to uh, Didier Kelo and Michel Mayor, who discovered the first planet around a star like the sun. The pulsars are not anything like the sun. They're dead stars. Um, they're very small, they're very unusual objects. Um, so astronomers really didn't expect to see planets around pulsars. They expected to see planets like Earth around stars like our sun. Um, instead, you have these, these stars around a planet, around a, you have planets around a star um, that has exploded in the past. So the star went supernova. So where did these planets come from? Why did they survive um, this supernova? Were they formed afterwards or were they captured afterwards? Um, and what are these planets like? Do they have uh, you know, warm surfaces? Could life exist on these planets? The pulsars are a very extreme environment because of uh, high magnetic fields and particles. So this, this discovery actually raised a ton of questions. Um, and really these questions are not answered. 
Um, there's been a little bit of work since uh, the early 90s on pulsar planets. It turns out they're not very common. This was almost a lucky discovery. Um, but most uh, scientists who, works on, who work on exoplanets like me uh, focus on planets that orbit stars that are a lot more like our sun. But in any case, um, these, because of the pulses of this, this really precise star, uh, we're able to detect these tiny planets, which are about uh, three times the mass of Earth. Um, and really uh, early on just sort of change the course of, of, of exoplanet science. Um, so just to, to finish up, the, so here's a little artist rendition of what these, these planets look like. And the great challenge in astronomy is that um, we can't actually go out and, and do experiments on the objects in the sky. We, we can't go out and measure how far away something is with a ruler or put it on a scale and, and to see how massive it is. Instead, we have to, to use what, what's available to us. And when you have these ticking clocks in the sky, it really brings, uh, gives you a chance to, to bring down what's happening in the sky onto Earth and, and then use this additional information to learn a lot more about these, these really extreme environments. Okay, I think I've taken enough time, so thank you, Kevin. Awesome, thank you so much, Max. That was really cool, like hitting all the history as well as the scientific advancements that were you know, related to all of these discoveries is, uh, is really awesome. Thank you for, for, for teaching us all about that. Um, yeah, so as always, uh, if you have questions for Max about, um, about the science he was talking about in the history, please write it in the, in the, in the comments and I'll, there have already, already been a few and I will read through them and ask Max, but um, if you have more, feel free to chime in. And maybe Amy will jump in too. <laughs> Ooh, nice, getting through the scotch, excellent. Um, okay, so how about a question from Andrew Reitemeyer? Are there any relativistic effects that could affect the periodicity of a far pulsing object, like a partial eclipse by a black hole? I guess this is mainly in reference to the stuff you covered at the end where you were talking about pulsars and that sort of thing. So are there, could relativistic effects, and just so our, our, our viewers are all on the same page, um, relativistic just means in a high region, a region of really high gravity where um, the classical description of gravity no longer applies and you have to start using Einstein's relativity to describe things. So near a black hole or near a pulsar or near a white dwarf, something like that. So are there, just going back to it, are there, are there areas where relativistic effects could affect that periodicity? How, how the pulses are arriving to us? Yeah, so the... Uh, I think that the best example is the, the uh, double neutron star discovery from the 80s. So um, a lot of you probably have heard of the discovery of gravitational waves a couple of years ago um, from LIGO. So that was a direct detection of gravitational waves by seeing how they squeeze space um, from a, a pair of, of merging black holes. Um, but actually gravitational waves have been, uh, there was significant evidence from them in the 80s from uh, a pair of, of neutron stars. So uh, you had these two neutron stars that were orbiting each other. And one of them was a pulsar, which means we saw its signals. Um, and uh, people, astronomers basically measured, again, like I was saying, measured these pulses very precisely um, to trace out the orbit of these two neutron stars. And what they found was that the orbit was actually shrinking. Um, so usually orbits don't shrink. So, you know, Earth's orbit around the sun remains more or less constant. Um, but the, these neutron stars were getting closer to each other. And this is actually a direct prediction of general relativity. Um, it's due to the emission of gravitational waves, which emits energy through the gravitational waves and steals energy from the orbit. And so the, these uh, neutron stars were, their orbits were shrinking at exactly the rate that was predicted by general relativity. And this was confirmed using um, the pulses of that. So this was a very early confirmation of gravitational waves um, from the 80s. It took another you know, 30 years to actually directly confirm it. Uh, let's see, other question. What's the closest pulsar to the Earth, asks Stephen Schreier. That is a good question. I, I have no I idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that one. Um, yeah, so the, probably the most famous pulsar is uh, the Crab Pulsar. So that's from uh, in, the, in the Crab Nebula, which is a the remnant of a supernova in 1054. Um, so that was observed, that supernova was observed and recorded um, all over the world as a really bright star. Um, and then it, we now know that there's a pulsar that
that's the remnant of the, the star that exploded. And it's sitting in the middle of this crab nebula. Um, so that's been observed in radio and optical and a lot of other ways is this, this flashing light. And actually, I think you can, if you have really good vision and a really good telescope, I think you can see this, this pulsar. Um, and you, uh, supposedly you can see it blink. If you what? Because I think it's about I think it's about thirty hertz. Like the is it, it rotates really? about. 30, so you can see a flickering or whatnot. That's what I. Oh, I've holy heard. cow! I mean, I've looked at the Crab Nebula through a telescope before. Yeah. So just so everyone, uh, for those of you who are amateur astronomers who may have you know pointed your telescopes up in the sky, either from a city or out in the countryside. Um, there are objects called the Messier objects, like M1 or M57 or M45. Those are just different objects that are named based on this catalog that this guy named Charles Messier came up with a couple hundred years ago. But the first object, M1, Messier object number one, is the Crab Nebula. And it's cool if, I mean, you need a reasonably sized telescope to be able to see it, probably like 12 inch aperture or so. Um, but but it looks, yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's cool to see this remnant of a supernova that was so bright in the sky a thousand years ago that it was like brighter than the full moon in the sky. And you could see it during the daytime, which yeah, is just it's, it's cool to see an object that you know didn't exist a thousand years ago, right? You yeah. couldn't point a telescope and see it a thousand years. It was just a star, but now it's this big expanding cloud. Yeah, but I didn't realize that the pulsar in the interior could like be resolved with, you know, Maybe yeah, that's that's what I've read, but I haven't experienced yet. Yeah, I'll have to I'll get gonna, a 24 inch or something. Or can... Now I've got a challenge. Yeah, point the Mount Wilson uh, 60 inch at it or something like that, and see if you can see it. That's cool. Yeah. All right, I got I got a question in here too. Right, so I'm a chemist. You're an astrophysicist. So let's throw it down. Atomic clocks, pulsars. Ooh. M more accurate, more. You need you need both, I think. Yeah, so sometimes pulsars have I don't know much about atomic clocks, but pulsars sometimes have glitches so they they are very regular in in a sense um but two things happen that that changes a little bit so one thing is that they can slow down so they're emitting some energy and actually this energy comes from their rotation and so as they emit the energy they they have to slow down their rotation so this happens in a very controlled way so you can just measure how slowly or how much their their spin is is decreasing um and but when so once you account for that it's, it's very accurate the other thing is there are these glitches so sometimes they're they're they kind of skip and they they get shifted off by a little bit, uh, which we think is because of essentially like an earthquake type thing happening on the surface that that shifts it around and um, and then kind of changes the the rotation. Oh, that's super interesting. Thanks, Max. Very cool. They're they're the wind up clocks of. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. And that relates to a question that Lucy asks, what kind of phenomena can physically change a neutron star's rotation period? So I guess you're talking about the glitches from some sort of star quake that erupt and could kind of tweak things. But yeah. also, for instance, I thought in general, neutron stars were slowing down. I mean, aside from the one that you were describing for the for the, the, the binary uh, neutron stars that were slowly slowing down their period because they were emitting gravitational waves. But it was my understanding that neutron stars themselves, when they're pulsing, are slowly slowing down because they're, um, there's like magnetic braking. They're, they're losing some of their, they're tra transferring some of their rotational energy into magnetic energy that then can slough off in other ways. Is that yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so that's true, but there is a way to speed them up. So we don't think that the, the ones that, that spin hundreds of times a second probably didn't form that way. Hmm. Um, instead, the way they, they probably form spinning a little slower and then um, they, they sped up because material basically fell onto the, the pulsar um, and it fell on with angular momentum. So in sort of a curved way and then it added angular momentum to the pulsar and sort of spun it up. So that's how we think uh, the really, really fast one. I think the fastest one spins almost a thousand times a second, the fastest one discovered. And so the way that those form is probably because of material falling onto it that actually increases the spin rate. Interesting. Cool. Um, Tanjavur Tiruvayaru asks, how pulsars, how can pulsars produce jet beams at their poles? I know that's not your focus, but, but we can uh, potentially talk about that too. Yeah, maybe maybe Cameron, you can take that one. That's not really okay. I'll, I'll I'll see if I can. So, um, 
Pulsars, basically any kind of highly rotating object, uh, as consistent with what Max was describing, is oftentimes seeking for a way to slough off some of that rotation, some of that angular momentum. And, and whether it's a, a rotating disk, like a protoplanetary disk, or if it's like a galaxy, um, that's obviously a much larger scale than an individual solar system, but but oftentimes has a, a, a disk associated with it. And you'll see jets that are flinging out material along that axis. And oftentimes the mechanism is not well understood for that, that, um, that ejection along the axis that, that produces the jet, but the, the outcome is, is is conclusive and that is it's a way of flinging out angular momentum from the system to kind of slow down the overall system. And so, uh, it, but it's definitely an active field of research to understand what the mechanism that's responsible for this is. In the, in the easiest sense you can imagine, um, maybe this doesn't necessarily apply to a, to a neutron star, but maybe it does if there's some sort of accretion disk associated with it where there's material slowly falling into it. Um, but this is definitely true for galaxies and for protoplanetary disks that uh, I wish I had some, I've got it here. I always look for models of things. So if you've got your disk, here's my plate that's a disk and it's rotating around. If you have any kind of explosion in the center of that disk that's, uh, that's isotropic, which is to say that's, that's traveling outward in all directions kind of uniformly, um, you can imagine that there's all the stuff in the disk that's kind of blocking it. And so you're going to effectively get some amount of, of a production of a jet because this stuff's in the way. The stuff along the equatorial plane is just in the way. And so stuff comes out like that. But that's not usually the mechanism that's associated with, with a really narrow collimated jet like you get out of, um, out of a neutron star. So I don't know the answer, but I don't think the answer is known. Yeah, that's, it's that's definitely weird. the details of pulsar emission is definitely not known. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but related to that, we might we might get some insight from our speaker next month, Saul Tokolsky, who works on numerical relativity and works on some of these uh, very high gravitational regime uh, regions of of the universe, like near black holes and near pulsars and that sort of thing, who may be able to provide some insight into that. Although I don't think he necessarily knows the answer to, but. Um, Anyway, that's my like get out of jail free card is like, I don't know the answer, but no one knows the answer. Uh, so, okay, let's see. We'll do with one more question and then go on to pub trivia. Oh man, these are some tricky questions. Chris Giorgi. Forgive me for mispronouncing your name for like a year. Thank you for providing me with a pronunciation guide, Chris. Um, are monojets possible due to the Harry, the Harry Ball theorem? The Harry Ball theorem is essentially, if you, I know it sounds suggestive, but it's not, it's just a mathematical theorem. If you have a sphere, I still have this pumpkin that has not rotted since uh, Halloween of last year. If you have a sphere and there's a bunch of hair on it um, and you wanna like comb down that hair, you cannot, the, this mathematical theorem, it's like a topology theorem, basically says you can't consistently do that and not have a cowlick that, where there's one area that, that is sticking, that's sticking up. And so it's applied to things like uh, black holes or neutron stars because it can imply that there's some sort of singularity on a surface structure around these things where you don't get uniform behavior. But it doesn't say that there has to be one, right? Because there can be two. There can you could be. have, and and that's what you know. The baseline assumption would be in physics is is symmetry. So you'd expect that that uh, there isn't any difference between the top and the bottom of the pulsar, and so there's no reason uh, immediately to assume that there would have only be one jet, uh, right? There probably should be a jet. You know, if the, if the star looks the same, the jet look, should look the same. But I feel like there are neutron star pulsar systems where the magnetic field distribution on the surface of the neutron star isn't just like this nice little polar axis thing yep. where you might have the magnetic field going out this way and then the other, mag the other pole going out this way and so, or close enough to each other. So I think there are systems potentially that can appear at some level like a monojet. But I don't know yep. if it has any any application of this um, this Harry Ball theorem. 
anyway, um, thank you, Max, for the for for the wonderful presentation and for fielding all of these tricky questions. Also, and, a question that's really not my my field of expertise. No, I know, I, I know you do a lot of <laughs> solar dynamics, and and so yeah, pulsar, neutron star, compact objects is challenging. But save those questions for our next speaker, and um, uh, in a in a month or so, and and hopefully we'll get more formal answers to them. But um, okay, so our next stage of astronomy on tap is pub trivia because everybody likes pub trivia. It's super fun, um, and the way we're going to do it here is let me share my screen i should probably like copy this into the i don't know how i'm going to do this let's see share my screen all right all right can you guys see this okay okay great so audience members what i encourage you to do is to go to W. Don't worry, this is not like some website that's going to log all your cookies and steal your information and hack your computer uh, or even require you to register or identify yourself in any capacity. You just go to www.menti.com and then just type in this code. Um, and what that will do is bring up in your browser or on your phone or whatever it'll bring up the questions as I ask them of you all and our speakers, and then allow you to respond. And then we'll see everyone's responses here on the screen. So I can see, see who's participating. Well, maybe not who, but I can see what your answers are to the various questions. So, uh, yeah, so, but this will show throughout. So I encourage people to participate. I, the other thing I encourage is there's no prize sadly except for knowledge itself i always say that you know it's it's like a dad joke but um there's no prize so there's really not any incentive to cheat and look these up many of these answers you can you can look up just on google and get the answer but i say just give it your best shot or if you don't have a good answer you know you can leave it blank or you can put in something that is maybe funny or something i don't know that's what people do in pub trivia right i don't know the answer so i'm gonna say Elvis Presley, or eh, that's not particularly funny, but you can say whatever you want. Um, so I encourage people to do that rather than cheat and look it up and then ruin the fun for everybody. But uh, it's your move, so. Okay, so today, Pi Day, is Albert Einstein's birthday for what was Einstein awarded the Nobel Prize in physics about a hundred years ago? What do you guys think? Oh, I wish I had my phone. Can I, can I put it in there? Yeah, sure. Put in, put in an answer. Do it. 1921. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for the number 1921. 1921. I'm getting spicy here. Hmm. Relativity, general theory of relative, hmm. photoelectric effect. Piezoelectric effect. Oh, I dig that one. Yeah. The best hair. The best indeed. hair. I love it. <laughs> it's interesting. Oh, I wish I had a photograph. If you look at young photos of Albert Einstein, he looked like a badass. He had like slick back brown hair. He's just like, there's this one classic picture of him. He's got his arms back and he's like, he's clearly knows he's the smartest dude in the room. And you're like, awesome. Cause you know, later in life when he became famous and he, he, um, he, you know, he just looks like an old dude, but, uh, but young, young Albert Einstein, what a, yeah, for being a physics chat. <laughs> uh, there's some good, some good ones here. So indeed, many of you guys got the, the correct answer. Oh, Brownie in motion. That's a, that's a good suggestion too. I mean, honestly, he should have received probably a few Nobel prizes. Like the dude did had major contributions to the field in a variety of fields. Um, for a variety of contributions, but but the main one for which he received the Nobel Prize was for the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect, as the name kind of suggests, photo means light, electric means, well, electricity. And so the, the main idea is that you've got some sort of uh, photon, light ray that comes in. This is a, a nice little uh, picture, cartoon of what an atom might look like. So you've got your nucleus made of 
p protons and n neutrons, and then you've got electrons kind of orbiting around it. And the photon comes in and it hits one of these electrons and it boosts the energy of the electron to the, to the point where it becomes unbound from the entire state. So it's, it's what's known as ionizing an atom. It kicks off this electron because of the energy gained from that photon. And in his original uh, kind of instrument, he was able to detect this because he, he shined some light on a metal surface that was in kind of a circuit and it caused a current of electrons across a gap. Basically, that was that was basically it, which is a pretty simple thing. This is just the ammeter just measures the current through the entire circuit. Um, but ultimately, this is like a major contribution because it 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 suggests the quantum nature of atoms that you have these electrons that are bound and they have to be boosted. It uh, you know it's the direct application of things like this is like a. a uh, an LED, a light, well, it's the reverse of a light emitting diode. It's a light absorbing diode, basically. Um, and and it, it, it kind of foreshadows much of the development of quantum mechanics and, and the physical nature of like electricity and light over the next century that we've used in, in, uh, in so many ways in technology today. So like, it's super important. I'd yeah. argue potentially more important than relativity itself. Yeah, so it, it really tells you that that photons have to exist, right? Because you need a certain amount of energy to remove the electron from the atom. And so what Einstein, well, actually what you know, experimentalists realized, uh, discovered before Einstein, what Einstein explained was that actually if the, ener if the light is not uh, high frequency enough, so if it doesn't have enough energy, um, it doesn't matter how much light you pour onto the atoms, the electrons won't come off. So the current will not flow if the energy of the light is too low. So if the wavelength is too high or the frequency is too low. And then as soon as you add enough uh, you, energy to the individual photons, then the electrons start coming off. And so that tells you that actually the, these atoms are seeing individual photons. They're not seeing light as a wave. They're seeing particles of light that have a particular amount of energy. And so they care about the, the individual energy of each photon not the total energy of the light falling onto the atom. Exactly. So it's the whole, people have probably heard the term wave particle duality of light or wave particle duality of, of matter for that matter. And, uh, and this was one of those kind of proving, proving grounds and experiments that really showcased it. So yeah. You know, relativity, point. like the reason why it wasn't awarded it, so they said was because there wasn't really experimental confirmation at the time. So it was really, you know, the theory was very interesting, but, you know, we, we didn't discover gravitational waves directly until 2015, and that's a consequence of, of, of relativity. So um, they, they really wasn't great, you know, Nobel Prize doesn't like giving awards to really speculative theories, um, but this really was an explanation of an effect that was immediately verified. That's a great point. But anyway, happy birthday, Albert. And thank you for all of your contributions to uh, science over the last, you know, 120, 120 years or so. Okay, next question is, which of these astronomical sources has not been seen to exhibit regular periodic, meaning repeated uh, emission? So this is related to some of the, the stuff we were just hearing from Max's presentation. So our four options are the sun, the cosmic microwave background, um, stars, RR Lyrae stars, and what was the what was the fourth one? Now it disappeared. Radio bursts. Oh, in the universe. Okay. Fat, fast radio bursts. Oh, fast radio bursts. Yeah, yeah, the universe. I was like, the universe. That's pretty broad. That's a pretty broad response. <laughs> um, fast radio bursts. That's right. Okay. Okay. One over overwhelming uh, winner here so far, but we'll see, we'll see. So just as we're waiting for all the answers to come in, everyone's familiar with the idea of the sun. The cosmic microwave background is the light that's kind of the light echo uh, from the Big Bang, effectively, the expansion, the early expansion of the universe. Are our Lyrae stars, are these repeating? Uh, well, I guess that's- uh, no, Don't, don't well, spoil it, Cameron. I'm spoiling it. I'm sorry, person <laughs> green that has one vote for our Lyrae stars. Uh, variable stars, much like um, what what Max was talking about, and then fast radio. Uh, nice two two for our Larry, and then uh, fast radio bursts. 
are these bursts of uh, radio waves that are coming at us from dis distant sources that last somewhere on the order of less than a second. Okay, I think the, the conclusion is clear. People seem confident that it is in fact the cosmic microwave background and the answer is indeed the cosmic microwave background. Everyone pat themselves on the back, but I still love you guys who voted for RR Lyrae stars. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, Max, do you want to talk about this at all? Yeah, I guess so. So the, I go one by one. So the sun um, has several periods of, of variability. So first off, there's an 11 year cycle in the sun um, of activity and, and passivity. So that's when the star spots appear and when they stop appearing. Um, actually, the sun gets brighter and dimmer by about 0.1%, I think, uh, over this time. And there's also shorter term uh, variations in the sun of, of order of days, um, just kind of vibrations of the sun, basically, that that you can measure with like really acoustic precise. Acoustic pulses or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of the gas is, is expanding and, and collapsing. Uh, yeah, the cosmic microwave background, as far as we know, is not variable. Um, in fact, it's really static. It just kind of sits there. Uh, our Lyrae stars are a lot like Cepheids. They're variable stars that um, go up and down in brightness. Um, and they're actually a lot more common than Cepheids. So they're really useful. Again, they have a, another period brightness relationship which makes them really useful for measuring distances. Um, and then fast radio bursts are these uh, bright bursts of radio, which are very mysterious. We don't really know where they come from. Um, but in the past few years, there's been discoveries of repeating fast radio bursts. Um, some of them are repeating within, over like many months. Other ones are within like a couple hours, you see these repeated uh, radio signals. So there's some sort of, uh, re repeating is really interesting because it means that whatever is creating this signal is not getting destroyed when it's created. So it's actually some sort of object that remains and is able to produce a signal again. Exactly. Yeah, not all FRBs seem to be repeaters, but there definitely is some subset that, of fast radio bursts that repeat. Yeah. Cool, thank you. That was great, great explanation. What mission is offering to send your name, audience member, you, your name around the moon later this year? And I will provide a link so your name can travel around the moon if you want to. Whoa, that's a big Artemis right there. Any other any other guesses? <laughs> Taltech admissions. <laughs> oh, if only they were so gracious. If only, if only. <laughs> Artemis, alternate spelling, good. Clean coal. Hmm. I don't know. Is there any coal on the moon? I mean, there must be. Geochemist, what do you think? Uh, coal? Uh, it would not. There's. I don't think the moon. You can get to pressures and temperatures required, and you would need a significant amount of organic matter. Even yeah. Carbonaceous chondrites wouldn't be sufficient. Oh. Okay. Well. There, oh, damn, I speculate and you solve my speculations. I like this. We, we're, we're quite a team. Ooh, so speculate. I like, like a, what is, isn't that what people who, who look for gold and stuff like you're, aren't you? No, I guess those are prospectors. Never mind. Oh, pro <laughs> I, I like to prospect as well. I like Death Valley going out there and checking out for prospecting for things. Um, oh, some good answers here. Bugs Bunny. Marvin the Martian. Oh, it's, yeah. I guess it's not Marvin the Moonian, the lunar, the, yeah, the lunatic. Um, so indeed, the answer is in fact Artemis. Uh, just as a reminder, the NASA, NASA Artemis program is kind of the successor to the Apollo mission program from 40, 40 odd years ago, uh, 50 odd years ago. And, and yeah, in, in about, two months, the plan is to launch Artemis 1, which is a spacecraft to go back to the moon. It will not land on the moon, but it will orbit. It'll, it'll be a translunar orbit. So it'll go behind and orbit behind. Wait, this is the Earth. I, I don't know what I'm doing. It'll, it'll orbit behind the moon and then come back. Just as kind of like, do we still know how to do this, guys? We did this a while ago. Let's make sure we're, we're on, the, on the right target. And then Artemis 2, which I think... I forgot the exact timeline and this doesn't have it, but um, it's either next year 
or may, I think it's next year. Artemis II is meant to have humans aboard, but again, it'll orbit around it. It won't necessarily land. And then Artemis III will, that's the one over here, will be a crewed mission to land on the surface, which is super exciting. And that's meant to happen in the next few years. So Artemis I, now NASA is allowing you um, with this link, as I'm sure you can, I mean, you can type it in. I can put it in the chat, but right now my screen is shared to show this as opposed to go back to the, to the YouTube chat. But if you go to this link, you can submit your name and they're going to, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a pressy thing, but they're going to put all the names that are submitted onto a flash drive, like a little thumb drive, and include that on the Artemis thing, Artemis One mission, which will fly around the moon. So you can be like, oh, my name went around the moon. So, you know, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Um, anyway, so get your boarding pass now. All right. Ooh, this is a spicy one. The head of the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, has made some very provocative statements in the last two weeks re uh, regarding continued collaboration with Western partners like NASA, European Space Agency, and so on and so forth. What is his name? Um, Vladimir Putin. Ming the Merciless. Indeed. Yeah, so I just want to go on the books and say I'm super bummed out about uh, the, the Russian aggression in Ukraine and um, the implications that it's having, first and foremost, for the Ukrainian people, like, geez. Um, but second of all, like messing up so much of, you know, this, this isn't good, guys. Like, it's super worrisome. And yeah, I, I don't, I need a few more beers before I talk about this, but I'm really, I'm super upset about the whole thing. And I hope that, that more level heads prevail um, in coming weeks and months uh, that can end this bloodshed. But it's having all kinds of implications, obviously much less important implications, but impl implications nonetheless towards uh, the continued collaboration of, of, of science and economic. And, you know, we live in a global world where everyone is a participant. And when you start messing that up, it really it really messes it up for everybody, not just the people who are participating. So um, I'm not stoking Russia phobia. I like Russian, I have Russian friends. I have Ukrainian friends. I am stoking uh, uh, frustration with governments that invade other governments. That is what I am stoking. And uh, you know, you can, you can call it what it is, but, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty upset with the whole business. Anyway, the, the answer is this guy, Dmitry uh, Rogozin. So he is a former, you know, deputy, uh, let's see, deputy director of the government in, in Russia um, and is now in charge of Roscosmos. And he, he's made some really frustrating and suggestive statements in, in, in the media recently, um, probably the most Wide, widely covered was a, a Twitter battle with former astronaut Scott Kelly, um, one of the two, the two uh, Kellys, the twins who've been up to the space station. He was formerly one of the commanders of the space station, and um, you know, there's there's a there was a, a Twitter battle a, a, a occurring last week, which you know is a bit frustrating, but also you know he's he's going out of his way to say things like. Oh, well, without Russia's participation, um, which, you know, Russia has a couple of boosters that are attached to the International Space Station, which because it's in near Earth orbit, it is slowly running into atmosphere. And so there's atmospheric drag. And so without continued propulsion upward, it would just fall into the Earth, which obviously is not good. Um, so he's basically made statements publicly like, you know, without us, you know, we could just leave we could, we could stop boosting it and, and the ISS would drop onto the earth, which is not obviously good. Um, but fortunately so far, um, communications and, and, and cooperation aboard the ISS is continuing to be okay from the astronauts and cosmonauts are, who are there. There are four American astronauts, two cosmonauts from Russia and one German 
um, astronaut aboard the ISF, and they're continuing to be like operating great. And honestly, that's you know that's how it should be. Uh, hopefully, science can step above some of the problems of the political governments that are doing you know problematic things and and continue this collaboration. I don't know, um, Amy. Does do you are you involved in any uh, stuff with um, well collaborations with Russian Russian scientists at all? I am not, but. Um... I know that, so in the Venus realm, right, you guys might have seen on the slide that I flashed up that was all like pixelated. The Nera D is a mission that Russia has been working on for a while. Uh -huh. And that was a, an international collaboration. So there were, I, I work with people who, who were contributing to that, those conversations. It's not even, I wouldn't say it's far enough along to, to be I, I don't know the status of the mission itself, but I do work with people who were going to meetings and talking about that. And we were told, we were informed that there will be no, no NASA participation, no American participation in the Nerody. More um, disheartening is the fact that ExoMars, right? The Rosalind Franklin rover that ESA, the European Space Agency is sending to Mars has now been delayed again, this time indefinitely. Um, this would be ESA's first lander rover on Mars, this was, you know, a, a, not a precursor to Mars sample return, but but their first test of the waters, yeah. if you don't mind the the pun, uh, to to look for organic molecules, th things of that nature, test out their rover technology in advance of, of Mars sample return, and because they, that is a direct partnership with Roscosmos, not just in terms of launching out of Kazakhstan, but actually a much more intimate relationship due to the sanctions that the European Union has put on, on Russia um, in response to this, this uh, horrible situation, it's unknown when or if yeah. that, will, that will happen. And they've already been delayed, right, because of the pandemic. So part of me is like, ah, if only it could have been gone and we would have been fine, but no. that, that's the scientific impact, but it's nothing you know, compared to, oh, I don't know, uh, the ISS. <laughs> crashing into yeah the, i mean the know. iss isn't uh, meant to be retired for another 10 years or so and it's but, but you you make it i'm so glad to hear that you know the astronauts and the cosmonauts are, are doing well because i don't know i think i have the naive i'm a trekkie at heart and i have the naive dream that space and space exploration will unite humanity in some way and i think it has the promise to but i don't really want to get to like first contact a la Zephram Cochran. And the reason that we meet the Vulcans is because there's a nuclear war that's destroyed most things. Agreed. Yeah, Agreed. And there's really been 50 years of, of collaboration between the US and, and Russian, so then Soviet space programs. And that, that was really a symbol of, of international cooperation and unity. So it's, it's really frustrating to see that um, kind of wiped away. And, and I hope- Well, we can... hopefully it isn't yet. Hopefully it yeah. isn't yet. Um, it's just, yeah, it's it's a bummer if it comes to that. And I really hope it. I really hope that things cease as they are, and uh, and that yeah, the science can continue uh, past this whole thing. But um, yeah, I'm a huge Russophile too, which is the I'm like super bummed out by all of this. But anyway, okay, moving on to less politically charged topics. Something that can help all of us is how do you find the North Star in the night sky? Many of you will know this, many of you may not, but I wanted to do this because I want to make sure everybody knows how to do this <laughs> because it's a useful thing that it's easy and it's useful. Um, so yeah, that is a fine answer. Look north or very carefully. <laughs> um, there, are, there are a number of ways of finding the North Star and those are two of them. Uh, but hopefully I'll come up with uh, with a follow the Big Dipper, follow the belt of Orion, click your heels three times. <laughs> oh, these are good. These are good. Mm. I do like to twirl. Usually it gets me there most of the times. The Hipparchus method. Hmm. I don't know. Do you guys know that? I don't know the Hipparchus method. Do you know, Amy? <laughs> yeah, wow. He's going back, or she, sorry. They are going back to, to ancient Greece and just trigonometry, effectively. Oh. Isn't Hipparchus the, the one that used yeah. the, um, the well to figure out the distance? 
Yeah. If that's I recall true. correctly. That is a good, yeah. I don't There's know. A, Maybe I've got the wrong have been. That person has either a better better knowledge of it than me or has their their Wikipedia open right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was I think it was Eratosthenes who uh, you're right. Eratosthenes. Got the wrong, yeah. got the wrong so person. that was that was getting the size of the earth by uh, you're right, figuring you're right. out where the the solar, you know, the sun was was directly upwards directly or where it was slanted it. and yes, you can right. use that to, to figure out the size of the earth. It still I'm sure has to do with trigonometry. Yeah. Chemist. Yeah, indeed. I I I, I, I plead the fifth. I defer to Max. <laughs> I defer to Max. Um the uh, there are a variety of, of answers. Uh, some of these are definitely correct. The uh, oh, I like the Pointer Sisters. That's a they've got that Neutron Dance from the eighties. That was a good song. Anyway, um, the the answer that I was going to suggest, so everyone knows, because it's usually pretty often times that if you're in the northern hemisphere, you can see you can see and recognize the Big Dipper in the sky. And if you look at the two kind of end stars of, of what I refer to as the dip part of the dipper, not the handle part of the dipper. They're called the pointer stars and they point towards Polaris. They point towards the North Star. And there's a bunch of stars over here, but this is by far the brightest one. And if you're in a city, well, if you're in a city, well, you can just ask somebody which way is North. But if, if, you're, if you're in dark enough skies, uh, but even in bright skies, skies, for the most part, you can see Polaris. Even in here in Los Angeles or in New York City, you could tend to see the North Star. As you know, you just look for the mountains, and those are those are north. That's right. That's right. Right, the mountains are north. Exactly. Mountains. I learned that in grad school, and then when I went to Berkeley for my postdoc, I was very confused. Yeah, because <laughs> the mountains, I guess, are to the well, to the west and to the east, but primarily yeah. to the east, right? Not yeah. north. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is this is one particular way, and it's super useful to know. So I encourage everyone to at least those of you who live in the northern hemisphere. Sadly, there's not such a trivial way to find the the direction of south in the southern hemisphere. There is no south star. There's no star that happens to be at the same location as the south celestial pole, our axis of rotation. Um, yeah, but. Um, I found this really cool thing that shows a bunch of different things that if you can identify the Big Dipper, which, as I said, is pretty straightforward, pretty identifiable, you can identify all sorts of things like you can keep going past Polaris all the way to the square of Pegasus, which can help you find, for instance, uh, the Andromeda galaxy if you have dark enough skies. Or you can, um, there's all, if you go from the handle, they always refer to Arc to Arcturus and then Spike to Spica you know, in case you just want to point out things. But really, by far the most useful one of these is going to Polaris, because that actually tells you something that's useful, like what are the cardinal directions in the sky? Okay, next question. In which of the following works of science fiction does the planet Venus feature prominently? So we'll see who are the true, the true sci-fi sci aficionados here. I thought I knew sci-fi, and I haven't read any of these books shamefully shamefully Shame um, on you. yeah i know i know so venus uh venus so um so amy came up with this question related to venus and obviously to the da vinci lander so i'm very excited about this but uh there'll be good insight into uh the reading um the background of our our audience <laughs> <laughs> Or at least who's playing, who's playing along, yeah. Indeed. This is, this derives from, you know, a, a deep-seated love of science fiction from childhood and also the fact that I was an English major in college with the intention at one time of being an English professor who would focus on science fiction. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know. Wait, so you but, studied English as your primary major or you were a double major? Uh, no, I made up my own major, ultimately, which was this just agglomeration of all the things I studied. It was, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I got away with it. It was a liberal arts college and they liked me, I guess, enough. But wait, where were, you, where were you studying? As an Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. Oh, sure. In Pennsylvania. Yeah. 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 No, it was, it was pretty great. Um, I feel really fortunate that I was able to just like pursue an intellectual path, right? But yeah, yeah, then, you know, somehow ending up at Caltech for grad school, I, I took a year off and did a lot of extra coursework while I was working to, you know, get to some place where I could apply to grad school. But yeah, Caltech was a fire hose, but I loved it. Now you're inspiring science fiction writers, so. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Love it. Yeah. Okay, so the answer indeed is it's a All trick question. <laughs> <laughs> it is a trick question. Oh, curse you, Amy. What are you doing? Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. Uh, and and I imagine that a lot of people don't know all of these authors, although I'm surprised that Caliban's War didn't get uh, more more votes. So um, the long range, so why are there dinosaurs in a, in a swamp, right? So long before we had observational information about Venus, uh, people hypothesized that it was this water world, either it was like a panthalassia, right? Like an ocean world, uh, or it was like the early earth or some variant of it. So here, you know, we're, we're looking at sort of a, a, a Jurassic, Triassic, Cretaceous kind of period, uh, full of swamps and lush jungles. Um, and and it, it was for whatever, and of course, beautiful people. There were always beautiful humanoid people-ish things inhabiting, inhabiting Venus. Uh, it took a while. Uh, but even pre-Mariner, which was one of the one of our early um, spacecraft to explore Venus, I guess spectroscopic information sort of suggested hmm, maybe it's not so Earth-like after all, and maybe it's more desert-like, and that led to science fiction involved in terraforming. Right? You think about terraforming Mars, all like that is pretty common now. But Venus was a thing. So Bradbury, this is a water-rich short story. You can find it in the Illustrated Man if you happen to have that collection. He's got another uh, short story that I didn't put in because I don't remember what collection that's in, but there's like a pretty, well, of course I can't remember it now. I was gonna say a memorable quote, I blame the scotch. Uh, <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke, right? Of course, also here's another watery world, but this one deals with someone had asked a question about microbes, right? And planetary protection and what happens if we contaminate a planet and basically just like, oh, I don't know, smallpox killing, you know, Native Americans, thanks. Spanish and, and other uh, conquerors of South America. That sort of thing happens in, I think it's in Before Eden. Um, Paralandra, is, if you're familiar with C.S. Lewis, right, people think The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. C.S. Lewis wrote this trilogy of science fiction stories um, that do have sort of a, mm, I wouldn't say spiritual, kind of a religious style, right? Angel-y type things, demon-y type things. Um, and of course, a protagonist who ends up going to Mars in the first book. And going to Venus to try to beat out these uh, uh, evil folks, and, and there are beautiful people on Venus, of course, that he has to save. So that's the second in a trilogy of stories that I didn't even know existed until. Uh, oh, I've had too much scotch. An ex uh, suggested that I read it. Not an ex at the time, but anyway. Um, sorry, TMI. Anyway, Caliban's War. Come on, people. The Expanse, right? If you read the whole series, Caliban's War is the second in the Expanse series. The protomolecule sits in Venus and does its thing and then boom, blasts off. I mean, watch the show. It's great, but read the books. Okay. I really, I need yeah, to. I, no, I, I love The Expanse, the show. I've, I've read two of the books, but yeah, I think that that really captures the like weirdness of Venus, right? It's all about, you know, how even hundreds of years in the future, people don't really know what's going on on Venus. And that's the place where you did weird things. Exactly. Thank you, Max. That is a great advertisement for Venus and future exploration. But oh, you're absolutely and, right. And just to follow up, uh, there had been questions before about where to get the t-shirt that Amy's wearing. And I posted it in the, in the, in the various chats. So um, you can go there. No proceeds go here. No proceeds get, go anywhere, right? Because it's just one right. of the Venus team members did this like right. at, at cost. cost. So yeah, at cost, exactly. Yeah. And there's all kinds of, you know, permutations on color and stuff and style. So knock yeah. yourselves out, get those Venus shirts <laughs> for the decade uh, return to Venus. Sweet. Okay, I will go back to the last few questions. What comedian will go get to go to space asterisk in two weeks aboard a Blue, uh, Blue Origin flight. Prominent comedian. So everybody's familiar with Blue Origin. It's Jeff Bezos's version of private commercial space flight. Um, the reason I say space is it's not really, I mean, it's, well, depending on your definition of space, is it space, but it's a suborbital flight as opposed to some sort of like, he's not gonna send you to, to, uh, to Mars or to Jupiter or 
Venus for that matter, but um, there are different, different definitions for space. Ugh, oh man. Sorry, person. I didn't realize I was asking a horrible question. I was just trying to do something interesting for some people. Jim Carrey, Steve Colbert, Elon Musk, someone from SNL, Pete Davidson, by Don, by Don. Anyway, well, the answer is indeed Pete Davidson, this dude. Um, yeah, there's like a crew of six people who get to go up. Most of the crew are paying a lot of money to go up, but he gets to go up free. I guess it's Jeff Bezos's way of making sure he stays in the news. I guess it worked with me um, by, by making sure that some popular person gets to go up so it'll be in the news. Uh, but as I said, um, the suborbital flights, I mean, is it space? Is it not space? There's different definitions for space. Kind of the, one of the common distinctions is 100 kilometers or 62 miles up. And um, so in that case, it is going just above that. It is going into space. But other definitions are, you know, where, where you go substantially higher into space where there's no, there's no, there's no collisional uh, interaction between the atmosphere at that distance where there is down here at the, at the von Karman line at this hundred kilometer thing. So yeah, um, for similar, similar missions, a price tag, if you wanna go to space on a suborbital flight, they don't list the price that you have to pay in order to go up with Blue Origin. But if you wanna go up with, um, what's Richard Branson's Virgin, Virgin Galactic, it's like $500,000 for 11 minutes to go into space, which is cool, but I don't know. Seems like hey, a better... that's only a couple orders of magnitude less than my mission. So yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> just just put out a little bit more and you get to go to Venus. But, yeah, I'm not sure I would pay to go to Venus. <laughs> Indeed. All right. What is the only moon in our solar system believed to have formerly been a dwarf planet? Ooh, solar system people, what do you think? Titan, okay. Earth, interesting. Is Earth a moon? Hmm. Triton, okay. Triton, Titan. Hmm. Io, everybody's favorite moon. Well, I guess everybody's favorite moon is probably our moon, maybe. Pretty nice up there. I want to go. Mm -hmm. Good guesses. Good guesses. So just for reference to everyone, um, Io is one of the moons around Jupiter, one of the Galilean moons around Jupiter, known for its active volcanoes. Titan is, a, is a, one of the moons around Saturn. I, I believe it's the largest. No. Yes. Is it? I feel like Ganymede or Callisto might be oh, larger. Sorry, I thought you meant around Saturn. Oh, it's certainly the, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Largest around Saturn. Um, the only moon with a real atmosphere in the solar system, too. That's yeah. Right. So what, what was the mission? Cassini. Cassini Huygens. was orbiting around, and then it had it's the Huygens lander. Yeah, yeah. That, the that yeah. ended up landing on. That was a lot of inspiration for our probe, by the way. Oh, was it? Because it was having to deal with atmospheric processes and such. And boom. And boom. And high pressures too, right? Or no? No. The pressure on uh, Titan is comparable to that of Earth. You could, you'd be oh. fine. And it's nitrogen mostly. You, I mean, it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. Fine um, is maybe it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Charon is the primary moon to Pluto. Um, and I guess Triton is around Neptune. Okay, so it looks like Charon and Triton are the big winners here. And the answer is indeed Triton. Uh, so Triton has a composition that's really similar to Pluto and some of the other Kuiper Belt objects in the outer solar system. And it's also in this weird orbit around Neptune. Um, Amy or Max, do you want do you guys want to talk about it or I don't want to hog the spotlight here. About Triton? Yeah. Sure. And then Max, unless you want to you oh, want to go ahead. Okay, cool. Yeah. So Triton is um 
is a very interesting place. So when, so Da Vinci, right, the mission that I'm, that I'm on and Veritas, the other Venus mission that were selected, we were competing against uh, an IO volcano observatory mission called IVO and a mission called Trident, which would have been a flyby of Triton, this, this moon of, of Neptune. And the really interesting thing about Trident, or one of the many interesting things, is that when I believe it was Voyager passed by it, it happened to catch these geysers, these eruptions basically of some dark blackish material coming out of, uh, oops, hope you can't hear that, out of the, out of the moon. Um, and so, you know, that's one very tantalizing bit of what's going on in the subsurface. Tr Triton is now thought to be one of the ocean worlds in the solar system. So we have, yes, Earth is an ocean world, but places like Enceladus and Europa, Ganymede, possibly Callisto, Titan, all of these places are thought to have subsurface liquid water oceans. Now, where they are in the sort of, if you cut the planet or the moon in half, you know, where they fall with respect to different layers varies, but Triton is one of these places that could be an ocean world. And NASA is very excited about ocean worlds because the whole idea of, oh, you have to be close-ish to the sun to be in the quote unquote habitable zone for life to have arisen completely got tossed on its head when Galileo's magnetometers suggested that, you know, there is an ocean, a subsurface ocean on Europa. Uh, and so Triton is yet another place. And it's like, you have an ocean world and you have an ocean world and you have an ocean world, right? They're all over the place, it turns out, which is fascinating in the whole context of habitability and origins of life and possibilities for even just prebiotic chemistry. So anyway, okay, I'm waxing, I'm being um, pontific. Oh, that was great. That was okay. awesome. Awesome. Unfortunately, it wasn't selected uh, this time around. It's a little difficult to get there just based on orbital dynamics, um, but we'll see. Yeah, maybe maybe in the next, the coming decades. Cool, okay. Um, all right, our last question for the night. What robust microscopic creatures have been proposed as potentially the first interstellar travelers. So what little guys or gals have been, whoa, tardigrades right in my face there, um, have been proposed as the first interstellar travelers? No competitors? Nobody is gonna compete with the tardigrade, the Michlorians, <laughs> that is good. Uh, slime molds. Oh, I like that. Very small mice. Microscopic mice. Vlad, Vladimir Putin. Um, what else? Yeah. The proto molecule. Well, I'm not familiar with this. Right? I, I threw that. <laughs> oh, you did? From the oh. Expanse, man. Of course. Of yeah. course, the proto molecule has been out. Yeah, there. I haven't watched the Expanse. Clearly, I need to. Or red. <laughs> or red. Yeah. It's really like reasonable science compared to. Yeah. Star Trek or Star Wars. So it's really fun to watch, you know, people really deal with G forces for real. That's cool. Things like that. Yeah. You mean yeah. compared to the midichlorians? <laughs> it appeals. Does that say Furbies? Slime yes, there's Furbies. Well, there's Furbies there. <laughs> Micro spiders. Okay. Um, it is, in fact, tardigrades. I think they look cute. Um, other people disagree with me, but. They're called water bears some, sometimes as well. So these are little guys that are about half a millimeter in size. They're found all over the place. Um, algae, moss, um, all sorts of uh, environments from, you know, mountaintops to, to swamps. And it turns out that these guys are super, super robust to all kinds of things. You know, they can deal with pressures far in excess of what we can produce at the bottom of the ocean here and it doesn't kill them. They can get slammed into a wall at 2000 miles an hour and it's like, no big deal. Uh, they can get slammed by UV radiation and it, it doesn't hurt them. They can be dried out. They Actually, there was a mission that took them into space, to outer space, exposed in outer space for 10 days um, and they were like, yeah, that was a nice little vacation. Let's go. And it was fine. Like they, they were still able to reproduce. It didn't sterilize them. It didn't harm them. It was, yeah, they're crazy, these guys. So two things about tardigrades. One was the, um, I think it was Israel. Now I can't recall. That's the Indian Space Agency. 
no, yes, maybe it was. I don't know, one of the lunar missions um, that was supposed to land and it smashed into the moon, it had tardigrades in it. So now they're splattered all over the moon. Oh, so there so, are tardigrades on so the moon. So there are tardigrades on the moon now. Oh, um, no. The other thing about tardigrades is shout out to the audience, whoever is paying attention to the mycelium network in Star Trek Discovery will know all about the importance of tardigrades. Oh, wow. I have no idea if anyone online knows what I'm talking about. No, probably. About. There's probably like 15 people who are like, yes. <laughs> Yes. So one, we've totally contaminated the moon with tardigrades, but that's post, you know, Apollo contamination. Uh, so, heh, what does it matter? Uh, but also, yes, I can't even do it right now. Live long and prosper. <laughs> yeah, well, it's fine. Yes. Do we think that there is um, substantial, nice, nice, you got it. <laughs> you got do we think that there's substantial contamination from the Apollo missions on the moon? Because I know no. more, more recent missions have I mean, you 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 know better than me probably that there are there's like an office that's like we need to sterilize every surface of this mission that's going to go to some right. sort of foreign body. But did they not do that in the Apollo era? So right, so planetary protection was not really a thing early on. Um, in fact, right when the when some of the Apollo astronauts came back, the concern was more that they would be returning as vectors with Lord only knows moon moon contaminants, moonanites. They would be coming back with, uh, with you know, lunar bugs that would, you know, and Andromeda strain the entire Earth. But um, and, and that was, uh, gosh, what is it? Surveyor, one of the Surveyor missions, I think. Right. So NASA sent a bunch of missions to the moon, and it like explode, crash, woo, wrong trajectory, right? Never get there. <laughs> and some piece of one of the surveyors was brought back. In fact, JPL has it uh, has a piece of it in our um, in our little museum that people can come and tour yeah, yeah. whenever someday JPL does its open house again. Um, and there was concern, right? There was a whole bunch of debate about are we are the things that we're like sampling on this piece of material is it astronaut contamination to the moon? Is it lunar weird contamination to Earth? You know, there was this hypothesis for a while that there was, you know, moon, there were moon microbes of some sort you know, back coming and, back to Earth. But, yeah. but, you know, I mean, we've got a bunch of stuff up there. The, the key is, is that there, the moon with no atmosphere, right, is completely bombarded with the solar wind, cosmic rays, any kind of galactic, you know, uh, anything of that nature ultimately is just, it's being blasted, right? This is why we want to put astronauts in caves effectively on the moon. So yeah, we've left a bunch of crap up there. Um, but uh, I mean, the tardigrades are probably fine. They're probably, probably fine. Okay. They're, but, they're but we setting up have camp waiting for us. They're like, come on boys, come on ladies. Bring it on, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Yeah, the exactly. astrophysics side, there's a, this concept of panspermia, which is that, you know, maybe life didn't form on the planet we see it on now, maybe it formed on another planet around the same star and made its way to Earth, for example, uh, which is hard to do in the solar system because the planet's really far away. So it takes millions of years to do that. So that life would have to survive for, for that long. But um, there are exoplanet systems that are much more compact than the solar system. So the planets are a lot closer to each other and moving faster. And so that means that uh, actually, things can hop between planets much more quickly, more effectively, and, right? And, and that may make the difference for the DNA to survive, for example, in that you know interplanetary voyage. And so, it's really reasonable; it's re possible um, for you know a system like Trappist One for for life to start on one planet and then get knocked, you know, and, and land on another planet in the same system. Huh. Interesting. I know that there is a non like the calculation has been done that an impact uh, a large impactor on Earth which would knock out a bunch of Earth materials. It is the probability is not zero that we could have launched things that would land on Europa, for example. Um, it, it's, well, it's from the ejecta from the from impact. the ejecta from the impact on Earth, right? And so the the notion that maybe you'd have an independent origin of life on one of these other icy worlds. You know, you you can't. This is right. You can't rule out the the panspermia uh, type hypothesis in the sense that if you found something. Obviously, there are a lot of sophisticated tests we can do now. But I I didn't even think about the fact that that the, you know these exoplanetary systems like the Trappist One system, which I was looking at earlier today, they are so close together that yeah, it seems easy-ish to transfer things. 
Um, I just want to give a shout out to the person on YouTube who uh, dropped the "We're Whalers on the Moon, We Carry a Harpoon." We're tardigrades on the moon, we carry a harpoon. Very, very. Uh, props to you. Good job, uh, Ned F. <laughs> we're tardies on the moon. We carry a harpoon. Yeah. But there ain't no tardies. There are tardies. There are whales. So we tell tall tales and sing a whale in tune. Um. Well, we have reached the end of our 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 time. Um. Dr. Hoffman, Proto Dr. Goldberg, thank you guys for joining and the excellent presentations on 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 pretty interesting topics. I, I certainly learned something from both of them. So I really appreciate you guys joining us. And thanks to our audience members for sticking around um, for all of all of these hijinks and the pub trivia and coming up with such uh, clever responses. It seems like for the most part, people were 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 getting getting a lot of the answers. So well done. Uh, our next event will be in a month, April, I don't know, sometime in April. Our next stargazing lecture will be April 8th, which will be, as I said, um, Professor Saul Tokolsky, who's um, he's been in the field for like 50 years, does numerical relativity, he's part of the LIGO team, does gravitational waves, um, literally wrote the book on uh, numerical methods in physics that I used uh, 15 years ago in graduate school. So um, promises to be an interesting uh, presentation on, on general relativity or, and black holes and gravitational waves and so on and so forth should be really good. And then we'll have an astronomy on tap sometime later that month. But um, thanks everybody. And yeah, uh, stay safe. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks everyone.